It is now time for member statements. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Speaker, I rise in the House today to recognize the local efforts to raise awareness on the need for hospital services in Muskoka. This past weekend, over 1,000 people braved the cold to attend rallies in support of continued funding for the two hospital sites overseen by the Board of Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare. On March 21st, I was pleased to participate in both Hands Up for Our Hospitals rally in Bracebridge in the morning and the Save Our Services rally in Huntsville in the afternoon. Residents of Muskoka and East Perry Sound are concerned that due to changes in the health care funding model, the current budget shortfall may lead to decreased services at either South Muskoka Memorial Hospital in Bracebridge or Huntsville District Memorial Hospital. The single siting of emergency services or surgical procedures are two of the biggest fears. Muskoka is unique. Its large seasonal population and year-round tourism, coupled with the challenges of serving a large geographic area, including East Perry Sound and Algonquin Park, make continued investment in health care services a must. The mayors and councils of Bracebridge and Huntsville, as well as the District of Muskoka Council, are all working together and speaking with one voice to maintain sustainable quality health care. On Monday, as the Legislature resumed, I tabled in this House and presented to the Minister of Health a petition containing thousands of signatures to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario and the Board of Muskoka Algonquin Health Care. We will continue to advocate for continued quality health care services and would encourage concerned residents to be active participants in the ongoing review process. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Stevens, Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Mr. Speaker, I recently met with a delegation from the Ontario Book Publisher Organization, which represents 39 independent Canadian-owned Ontario-based publishers. The Ontario book industry makes up a substantial contribution to the province's economy. An estimated 15,000 books are published in Ontario annually. Ontario-based Canadian-owned book publishers generate more than 2,500 jobs. In 2012, Ontario publishers paid $256 million in salaries and benefits. The OPBO, which to express its appreciation and, and gratitude for the support it has received and continues to receive. However, more can always be done to assure the viability of Ontario book publishers. To that end, the Ontario book publishers have requested more support for the use of Canadian resources in Ontario schools. Students should learn about the world around them through Canadian content rather than imported material, thus providing a sense of shared cultures and values. The respecting of copyright in our schools and to ensure that all parties consent User, content users, Ontario education publishers, and the creators of the content are treated fairly and to stem the loss of revenue leading to cutbacks, layoffs, and closures. An expansion of the Ontario Book Publishing Tax Credit to include the translation of Canadian authors by Canadian translators from into French, English, or Aboriginal languages so as to encourage greater understanding among the language groups. I am proud that Ontarians maintain a vibrant and independent book industry, and we must look to sustain Ontario authors and publishers as a foundational plank for our culture. Thank you. Member Statements. The member from Kingston in the Islands. Mr. Speaker, it gives me great pleasure today to tell this House about a Canadian first for my great riding of Kingston and the Islands. Pulse Point is the name of a new smartphone app that alerts trained bystanders about a nearby cardiac arrest so that they can help out. Here's how it works. In the vast majority of cases, when there has been a cardiac arrest, someone will call 911. The telephone operator identifies the location and enters that into the computer as you'd expect. At the same time, however, the computer alerts community members trained to give CPR who have the PulsePoint app on their phone who are within 500 metres of the emergency. The app shows them a map of how to reach the location and also shows any nearby public access automated external defibrillators, AEDs. Oh. Sudden cardiac arrest is one of the leading causes of preventable death. There are 40,000 in Canada each year. That's one every 13 minutes. Calling 911, starting CPR, and using an AED doubles someone's chances of survival. There are many, many examples of people whose lives have been saved in this way. Quite simply, Mr. Speaker, this app saves lives. Pulse Point was launched in Kingston and the Islands on Monday, though the collaborative efforts of Queen's University, the City of Kingston, Kingston Fire and Rescue, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, Kingston General Hospital, and Bell Canada. Wow. I'm so proud of my community. Kingston and the Islands will be leading the way for the rollout of this app all across the country, saving hundreds of lives each year. Thank you. Member Singh, the member from here on Bruce. Speaker, it's my absolute pleasure to stand today to celebrate the 100th anniversary of 4-H in Ontario. 
2015 marks 100 years of leadership programs for youth across rural Ontario, and we also not celebrate the program itself, but the successes that this program has achieved over the years. 4-H is a grassroots organization that engages youth in their community, environment, and society as a whole. 4-H allows us for its members to learn about topics, life skills, and agriculture through hands-on activities and mentorship. 4-H is close to my heart. I've spoke about having my first calf when I was 11 years of age, and uh, it offers lasting impacts, of which one is here today joining me. The executive director for Ontario Farm Food Care, Krista Mackay, is downstairs, and uh, I met her through 4-H, and it has just inspired so many amazing leaders across our province for the agri-food sector. None of this, I must say, Speaker, would be possible without the dedicated staff and volunteers of 4-H and the many local associations across this province. This weekend, I'll be attending the 100th anniversary celebration in Waterloo, where 4-H incidentally got its start 100 years ago. And yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah, I almost called you by Diane, your first name. There you go. <laughs> but yes, 4-H got its start in Waterloo 100 years ago. And I would dare say that anyone who has come through this program always contributes their head, heart, health and hands to anything they do. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say a few words today about an exceptional group of politically engaged young people in London. The London Youth Advisory Council is a group of 14 elected youth councillors between the ages of 15 and 25. Serving one-year terms, they gain experience in networking, leadership and municipal politics. Furthermore, as councillors, they get to represent other youths across, Ontario, across London's 14 wards by working on and speaking on behalf of issues that affect youth in their wards. Similar to a provincial campaign, these applicants go through three main phases phases, a candidate application process, campaigning and debating, and then finally an election. Throughout the process, selected candidates are required to partake in training sessions and debates. These sessions help candidates formulate their strategies and platforms, as well as give them a real-world experience into canvassing, door-knocking, and speaking with constituents, and rallying a support base behind them. Recently, in fact, the candidates have been selected, and throughout these next few weeks, the candidates will be campaigning, debating, and reaching out to constituents until the election, which takes place May 3rd and runs through May 8th. I look forward to meeting with this group of bright young folks in June to participate as their honorary councillor at one of their roundtable discussions. It truly will be an honour to speak with, with the up-and-coming generation of politicians in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it is so important for brilliant young forward young mind and enthusiastic people like themselves to be involved in politics, and I'm excited to what the future brings for all of them. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. March is Epilepsy Awareness Month. Today is Purple Day, a global day to raise awareness for epilepsy. As a newly minted pediatric nurse years ago, I realized that watching a child having a seizure is pretty scary. Epilepsy is a disorder where seizures can happen suddenly. I was trained to know how to manage a seizure, but lack of awareness and understanding can make it hard and scary for others to know how to respond. I encourage people to visit the Epilepsy Ontario website to learn how to help having someone having a seizure. Raising awareness about epilepsy will help reduce the existing stigma. There's no cure for epilepsy. However, proper treatment can help control seizures, assisting the person to live their life to the fullest. I have two close family members with epilepsy. I know that resources such as Epilepsy Waterloo Wellington Agency go a long way to supporting families with their work. It has a team of caring volunteers and staff who are dedicated to improve the quality of life for those with epilepsy and their support network through support, education, advocacy and public awareness. Thanks to Cambridge neurologists, doctors Kathy Gile and Dwight Stewart, the staff at Cambridge Memorial Hospital, and other caring health professionals who provide care in my Cambridge and North Dumfries riding that give hope to these and those that, that are living with epilepsy. Thank you. Thank you. Member Saban, Member from Halliburton, Fourth Lakes, Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I asked the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs uh, and the member from Peterborough to make a commitment to Kawartha Downs Racetrack and finalize a long-term transfer payment agreement. 
The track is a vital asset to not just our ridings, but the whole of eastern Ontario. So I was disappointed when the minister did not address my request uh, for a commitment for a long-term deal for Kawartha Downs and instead chose to discuss the steps the Liberal government took to address the issues in the horse racing industry, which they created when they cancelled the slots at racetrack program. So it really is a shame what they've done to this once world-class industry in Ontario. Kawartha Downs is the only track in the province without a five-year deal, and year after year is forced to just hope and wait and see how many race dates it will receive. Last year, they did the 11th hour um, deal with only 18 racing dates down from their usual uh, 90 to 100 date season. Despite this setback, though, Kawartha Downs went on to host a very successful season with attendance and wagering second only to Woodbine Racetrack in the province. Despite the success, the request for more dates was denied. They're still waiting to hear from the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs on their pools to ensure that they have enough horses to race. You need to have good pools. Um, for the future of racing, uh, we are down to the wire. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, it is time to give Kawartha Downs hope. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Member Statement, the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I, it's my pleasure to uh, rise today to recognize and to celebrate the achievements of the Fort York Food Bank. Mm -hmm. The Fort York Food Bank is an important community partner that provides much needed program and service for the most vulnerable of my riding to Trinity Spadina. Recently, the Fort, York, uh, the Fort York Food Bank held their third annual Lucky Ball fundraiser that raised approximately $30,000. A hundred percent of that donation received went directly to program and services at the food bank to help the community hungry and vulnerable. Amen. The, food, uh, the Fort York food, uh, food Bank originally focused on providing emergency food supplies, but having witnessed a substantial increase in changing needs in the community, they evolved from a food program into a community organization that provides an integrated set of services. Over the last 10 years, the food bank has served approximately 100,000 meals through their community kitchen, provided more than $3 million worth of food, and assisted more than 10,000 people through their counseling and advocacy services. I'm extremely proud of the uh, Fort York Food Bank and the work they do for the vulnerable of our community. I stand today to invite all Ontarians to recognize and celebrate the Fort York Food Bank's recent achievement and to emphasize the importance of supporting your local food bank and the work they do in your community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the member statements. The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. Speaker, I think it's with the gradual warming of the weather and people coming out of hibernation, what people are really looking for is what's a good place to go for a very nice dinner. And I just want to invite members and all Ontarians to uh, consider historic downtown Streetsville. In historic downtown Streetsville, we've got some of the most wonderful restaurants in northwest Mississauga. And not only that, you're going to get the uh, traditional Streetsville welcome, that western uh, Mississauga welcome that uh, makes Streetsville such a wonderful place to, uh, uh, to live, to do business, to raise a family, to, um, uh, to start something. And um, we've got some fantastic new restaurants. And in particular, there's, within the span of about three blocks, we've got three grade A Italian restaurants. And you must come out and try Goodfellows, Gabriel's, uh, Mondello, wonderful places to come and make sure that you try Saucy's. Our uh, Streetsville cuisine also includes some of the finest uh, of uh, South Asian cuisine. So, Speaker, um, when it comes to going out for dinner, not only Streetsville, but Meadowvale as well. And in Lisgar, we've got the Lionheart Pub with its um, uh, traditional Irish and English fare. This is a place to go for people to, who'd like to dine out in Mississauga, and I would encourage um, more people to come out now that the weather is good and to enjoy our cuisine in Western Mississauga. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements.